So it is a great pleasure to have you back here and to uh, introduce my dear friend, Zilton Faria Meira de Vasconcelos. He is a, was an undergraduate at UFRJ doing the biomedical course where we met. We were actually the same class, believe it or not. And after that, he pursued his master's and his doctoral uh, here through the immunology program under the supervision of Dr. Adriana Bonomi. But uh, uh, Zilton has always been very mature about his profession. He uh, had already done the uh, IFRJ, the uh, Instituto Federal de Ciência, Tecnologia e Inovação, uh, and had, was already working at the National Institute of Cancer, where he did all his uh, graduate work as well. And after that, he uh, was able to uh, I uh, work as a uh, temp professor or uh, visiting professor at the Federal Institute of Technology uh, in 2005. We followed after that, uh, becoming a research in public health at Fiocruz, where he is up to this date, uh, focused on uh, uh, early childhood diseases and immune deficiencies. During his training, he did a postdoc at the Seattle Children's Hospital in 2011, and afterwards into, uh, at the Center for Physiopathology Physio Physio <laughs> uh, in 2014. And he has uh, led his group uh, since then back here at the EFF. He has more than 68 article, uh, uh, research articles published, most of them already as a, a leader of groups. He has met five as less author. He has trained quite a few people for undergraduate students, seven master students, and a doctor students. And now he has two doctor students in the lab, right? And has done some beautiful work also trying to uh, test and uh, uh, better the tests that you can do on newborns to identify uh, an immunodeficiency. So if I start talking more, <laughs> I'll take the whole time. It is a huge, huge, huge pleasure to have you here. Zilton is one of the best uh, speakers that I've met since ever. So it's really great. Thank you again for accepting our invitation. No, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, you know, back home. <laughs> Can you listen to me well? It's okay? The audience is okay? Uh, I yes. Okay. Like Let's. Yeah. Let, yeah. If if anybody complains, yeah, we're gonna know quickly. So it's a it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Mia, from for the invitation. And um, and actually today I would plan to to deserve a little bit ten percent of what you told about me. But <laughs> at the end, uh, I would I would try today to discuss a little bit with you guys about genomics and the application of genomics to diagnose better uh, inborn errors of immunity. And we're gonna discuss a little bit about what this is and uh, what are the challenges to, this, uh, to do this work, okay? So like uh, Miriam was telling you before, uh, I work in the uh, Osvaldo Cruz Foundation specifically in one unit of Fio Cruz that's not localized in the main uh, campus uh, in Manguinhos where uh, everybody knows, you know, the castle and so on. But uh, we are located in the south region of Rio and uh, in the Fernandes Figueiras Institute. And uh, we, we are taking care of the health of women, child and adolescents. This is the mission of the, our unit there. And uh, I'm, a, I'm there, I'm a public health researcher and working in a clinical research unit. And uh, as an immunologist, when I came to the Institute, I became very interested to understand uh, the patients they were receiving in the hospital. And then finally I choose the, the pathway I, I started to work with. And then inborn errors of immunity, that's the new name of the group of diseases. On that time, it was called uh, primary immune deficiencies. Uh, 
I, I became, you know, really impressed about the, the sometimes the, the tragedies that the families pass through when, when a kid receive uh, a gene defect that I'm going to talk about just after. And then that's why I'm, I'm very uh, dedicated myself and the group in the lab to improve the capacity to diagnose and afterwards, obviously, to correct the genes that those kids uh, have, okay? So, uh-oh, it's not going forward, but I can pass for here. No. Oh, see? Uh-uh. No, it's stopped. Ah, okay. Okay. Thank you. So, this is a picture of the building where I work. You know, I, I like to to bring here uh, this, uh, this exactly where where it is today, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna next year be celebrating the centenario, you know, the hundred years of uh, our institute and everybody is invited to participate. It's gonna be a lot of uh, celebrations and it's gonna be on April. That's my birthday uh, month also. So it's a nice coincidence. So if you want to uh, be very welcome to, to our parties, let's say. And uh, we are, as I told you before, a unit of Kyotruz and we were, uh, recognized by the health ministry as one reference center for rare diseases, where the inborn errors of immunities are is included. And uh, we are a hospital at the end of the day also, and we do medical care, we do research and education. And actually now I'm responsible for the education, I'm the head of education of a unit. And uh, for you to understand how big is the education, and I'm crazy to be accepting this task in my unit because we have there uh, starting from uh, technical training and going until postdoc, but passing through medical residencies, nurse residency, and also multi-professional and uh, master and PhD for three different programs inside of this unit. In so it's really a uh, big area uh, for us also to train people there in, in the unit. So I'm located in this lab, you know, close to the, to the rock. And this is uh, also a, a nice place because, you know, cell phones do not work in that area. So the, <laughs> the students are more productive because of that. But <laughs> Uh, inside of this lab, it's like a consortium lab. A lot of uh, researchers are working inside there. And we will, on that time, to bring uh, technology to the hospital. And we started to implement uh, what we call the technological platforms inside of the hospital to do translational research, but also to help you know, like doing diagnostic support to the patients that came to our unit. So with that, we can help the, the families and the patients inside of the hospital, but it's like uh, returning back to the lab. We have like uh, many, many cases that we can really investigate and go deep to understand the diseases and to contribute scientifically uh, to this field the pediatric field that's very difficult to, to even to have financing in, in our country, for example. And uh, well, so those uh, are the, the technological platforms we have, and we are using all of those. We're gonna talk a little bit further on. So since 2017, I, I have been working with primary immune deficiency and created a, a network that we call Carioca Network for primary immune deficiency on that time. And on that time, it was really a, a lot of universities that were uh, connected to us. 
even here, if a PMG, and uh, people that maybe you know a lot, you know, Caterine and Fernanda Maris from the, from the hospital, the children's hospital here, and also Elaine, that was a partner that are uh, doing the lab work and helping us to try to, to do some uh, tests and um, mainly flow cytometry for those patients. And us in the middle trying to coordinate everything. And, uh, and all these uh, hospitals and uh, in the university uh, came as the allergy and immunology services that received those patients and started to suspect that they could have a gene defect in the immunology system. And then we started to do uh, gene sequencing. So on that time, the first project, we could sequence 122 patients. And for you to understand how difficult it is to, re to reach the final diagnosis of those patients. Until today, 40 of those patients is the number that we can reach the final diagnosis. So we reach the gene defect that caused the specific disease that the kid had. So our, let's say, efficiency in diagnosis using this technology, uh, you can say it's very low, but when you go to the, to the literature, you'll see that this is good. You know, this is more or less the normal efficacy you can see in all centers that work with these uh, diseases. Depending on the rare disease that you are working with, you can reach higher efficacy because the diseases are more, um, let's say, homogeneous. For example, I'm working with uh, ophthalmology for cat rat. And for that, I can reach 70% of efficiency uh, using next generation sequencing. But when you go to diseases that are more uh, complex and uh, heterogeneous, uh, you can go really low in the efficacy. And we, need, we, we have a long way until we can, we can improve that number, you know? And I'm using here exome sequencing and we're just starting to use the whole genome sequencing as a way to improve a little bit more the diagnosis of those patients. And the literature already say that you can improve around 10% of the cases that you cannot finalize with exome, you can improve in, in terms of diagnosis of those patients. Just for to understand the number. So what means inborn errors of immunity at the end of the day? So the first diseases, that were described, uh, it's already 1950s. And the first two diseases described is BTK, that's the famous Agama globulinemia. Uh, and uh, those patients, uh, have, uh, they have a defect in a specific kinase that is expressed during the developmental of B cells in the bone marrow. And this patient cannot uh, create one B cell <laughs> at least. In, in their bloodstream. And at, at the end, they need as a support treatment to receive infusions of immunoglobulins twice in a month. And you can imagine for that families, they need to come to the hospital twice in a month and to receive for uh, the full life of this particular kid, uh, the infusion. And, and um, it's a controlled uh, uh, pharmacy. So, uh, it's it's all not allowed to do in any any place. So if they live super far from the hospital, they need to travel and to receive the infusion inside of the unit that is allowed to receive those uh, those pharmacies. Okay. So Cosman disease is the second one described. It's a defect in the generation of neutrophils. And for example, you can have a gene defect in the GCSF air, the receptor of GCSF, and you don't produce at all uh, neutrophils in the bloodstream also. And you can imagine the, the, the problem that those kids have. So at the end, nowadays, we have more than 4, 450 genes that's already described it and connected to inborn areas of immunity. And normally the mutation is alter the functions of immune system or even the developmental of, T of cells from the immune system, like I told you before. 
usually those patients, they uh, are very associated with repetitive infections. There is not only infection, but severe and repetitive. Uh, sometimes they are associated with autoimmunity because you can, you know, understand that the, the gene defects could be related, for example, of developmental of T-Rex. And then those kids, they display a severe autoimmunity also at birth even. And they increase the chance to uh, neoplasia, cancer, you know, leukemia, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, it's very frequent on those patients. And uh, the, the vast majority is really in the first infancy, the onset of those um, clinical manifestation like infections or autoimmunity, okay? So not everything is bad. There are something that helps. You know, all the diseases, they are constrained inside of uh, one system only, you know, because all the, the cells from the immunity are generated in the bone marrow. So you can imagine that one potential and useful treatment is to replenish the bone marrow of the, of the patient with normal cells, normal in terms of the genes they they, they have, right? So if you have a, a specific gene defect, like I told you before, that cannot uh, generate neutrophils, you have a defect on the receptor for GCSF, you can replenish the bone marrow of that patient with a logenic bone marrow that do not have any, any problem. And then the patient starts to produce the cells and everything could, could be okay. But then you have the problems of a bone marrow transplantation. Uh, you, you can have the graft vessels disease, you can have failure of the, the bone marrow that the patient is receiving. And this is not uh, the, the best approach. Uh, we, can, we can do something better. I'm gonna discuss this after that. Uh, but for example, another disease, like I told you before, the B cells is the same, right? You, you can have the problem of generating these cells, for example, and you can infuse the immunoglobulin, like I told you before, or you can do a bone marrow transplantation if it's too severe, the disease that the, the kid is displaying, right? So this is only the graph showing how it's increasing the fields in terms of number of genes that are related to inborn errors of immunity. And I cannot see any plateau in this curve so I believe that we're gonna be in increasing this number uh, through the years. And obviously we try to, to put those genes in the box to understand the, the part of the immune system that are being affected by a gene. But when you see the list that are published every two years by the International Society of Immunology, uh, you can see that some genes, they appear in different uh, boxes because some genes can affect different areas of the immune system, okay? So it's not easy to do this test and it's not easy to uh, keep updated in the field. <laughs> this is very uh, telling me also. So that's why I, I, I brought this uh, slide. It's a very nice uh, review that I suggest you to read if you are interested because at the beginning, uh, we, we believe it that one gene corresponding to one disease, but this is not true at all. You know, there are many, many, many genes that when it's mutated, you can cause different phenotypes. And for example, the disease that I, I went to Toulouse to study, that is uh, Wiscott Aldrich syndrome, has a specific gene that is the WASP gene. And this gene, Depending where the mutation occurs, you can have, for example, loss of function that uh, display the phenotype of the syndrome kid, the wiscott aldrich syndrome uh, kid that has, for example, autoimmunity, immune deficiency, um, uh, thrombocytopenia, a lot of uh, specific characteristics. And there's another that is a gain of function that creates a completely different phenotype with a severe congenital neutropenia. And this patient 
has nothing to do with the, the Wiscott Aldrich patient, but the gene that is affected is exactly the same. So this depends obviously where the defect appears and where uh, uh, it's, uh, it's changing the, the, the molecular uh, relation, specifically in these genes with the, the, the counterparts. Okay? So uh, in the other way around, many genes also can cause the same clinical phenotype. Uh, for example, the severe combined immune deficiency, the SCID patient, you know, nowadays has 20 different genes that generate the same clinical phenotype, okay? So obviously there are some differences between those kids. For example, the IL-2 receptor uh, gene mutated uh, kids has a T cell negative phenotype in the bloodstream, but they have B cells. But at the end of the day, the clinical phenotype is exactly the same. The expectation of life is one year old. Uh, they do not produce well immunoglobulins because they don't have T cell health. So they have a lot of uh, uh, clinical, uh, clinical uh, aspects that is quite similar and they need to be treated in the same way and quickly to do a bone marrow transplantation to rescue the patient. Then we have, for example, in the hospital, four patients that were transplanted and they are very much okay. The diagnosis needs to be done at birth. And that's why there are some you know, uh, trials around the world and uh, in the United States and, and Europe is already doing the, uh, the neonatal screening tests for those particular kids. To, to rescue them. So, so the, the, the field is changing a lot, the, the, the comprehension about the, the gene and the, the clinical uh, phenotype that they present afterwards. Okay? So in terms of treatment, I told you before, you know, the cellular therapy is really a nice therapy, but the gene therapies could be very useful if you believe that you can do the correction in the self bone marrow. So you take the autologous bone marrow, you treat and correct the specific gene, and then you replenish the, the, the system with the, the cells that belongs to the same patient. So this is very much uh, better in terms of, uh, in terms of histocompatibility, obviously. And, uh, and this is the real precision medicine. But to do that, you need to know exactly where is the mutation, exactly the gene that is affected. And then you can go to the next step to choose the way that you're gonna deliver the gene correction and then to replenish the bone marrow of the patient, right? That's why, you know, we are doing a lot of efforts on diagnosis before because it do not make any sense to go to a specific gene in more than 450 diseases and maybe you are going for a specific gene that is super, super rare instead of going to the genes that needs to be firstly addressed to resolve the, or to solve the problems of those kids, right? So you need to understand a little bit of the epidemiology of those diseases, you know, based on diagnosis in the country. And then you go further to understand the best way of doing gene therapy. So just to understand how we are doing now, we have a library preparation of those exons. For that, you need to, to do fragmentation of the DNA to connect adapters and to barcode. And barcode is very useful to do this kind of work because you need to put uh, 200 patients together to one round of sequencing. And that's the way we are doing now. So the, the most interesting way of doing this is really to create a hub of sequencing where everyone that work with different rare diseases can send the DNA from those patients to a specific place. And that place is gonna prepare the libraries to do sequencing. And, this, and with this approach, you can put the costs very low. Instead of every lab having the, uh, your own sequencer and it's gonna be you know, impossible to pay, other country to do this kind of work, right? So, uh, 
Nowadays, we are working with the Nova 6 6000. It's located in the National uh, Cardiology Institute. It's very close to EFF. Geographically, it's very interesting. Also, it's 15 minutes by Uber <laughs> to reach there. So we can do uh, quickly, you know, the preparation. Then you need to do, uh, you need to do the, the amplification of those fragments in clusters. And then you'll do the, the sequencing. And we are using the Illumina platform, but there are some, you know, starting uh, discussion if you choose to use the MGI platform also. It's a, it's a Chinese uh, platform that seems to be giving a very good result after the sequencing of those, uh, of those patients also. And finally, we go to the worst part of the thing. Because you believe that this is difficult, this is easy. This three step is very easy when compared with the last step. So the last step, we need to do bioinformatics to align everything that's sequenced. And this, already this is a challenge because we have very few bioinformatics in the country. And when you have, they are so, you know, <laughs> overwhelmed that they cannot they cannot do this you know regularly you know so you you need to have your own bioinformatics or you need to train people to do that otherwise you cannot reach that path and finally after that that it's already a challenge you have to do data analysis and this is the worst because you can you can do the first second and three step in two days and you can stay one year or more doing that analysis if you don't know how to do it you know? or even more than this even in those patients that i told you before that i cannot reach the final diagnosis we go back to the data and, uh, every two year two years because you know the databases are being updated and then you need to reanalyze the data to try to see if there is any novelty in the area. And finally, you, you, you close the case, right? So it's a huge effort to do this data analysis. And normally the alignment and bioinformatics, we are using those two pipelines. And for analysis, we have different platforms, some paid and some uh, free to use. And some there uh, are more user friendly, and some are more very intense work. You know, with you know nothing super fancy to be to be working with. Okay, so we are we are using like I told you before, plat of, uh, technological platforms. We use uh, Nova Seek as the platform to sequence. And nowadays we are doing bioinformatics inside of the cloud as everyone in the field and in the world. And we are using the Azure cloud from Microsoft because Fiocruz has a, a contract specific with them, but there are different ways of doing the cloud. You can use Google cloud platform. You can use Amazon. That's very easy to, to use at the end. And it's the best way to do in terms of, uh, of uh, not uh, needing to have a, infra, a local infrastructure, right? And then you can use, you can scale up whenever you need, when you receive the, the patient's data, and then you can scale down whenever you finish the alignment and the processing of the samples. And uh, at the end, it's uh, cheaper to do that instead of buying all the infrastructure and to have personnel uh, working uh, and even to uh, update the machines and so on. Okay? So just to understand the day by day, and uh, I decided to bring one specific case to understand the challenge of doing the diagnosis since the beginning until the end. And then you can realize 
And this is just one case, you know. Nowadays, we have more than 500 exomes done in the lab. So we have a lot of work to do. And I'm gonna show you how, how difficult sometimes it is to reach the final decision of what gene and what disease the patient has, okay? So this is one case in the lab. And uh, after the exome sequencing, we reach with more than 95,000 variants in the exome sequence. So how can you find the unique variants that's related to the disease? It's very hard to go one by one, right? You forget about it, you cannot do like that, right? So what, what we use, we use, for example, the gene list that I told you before, it's an initiative for International Society of Immunology trying every two years to update the list that is, has the, the genes that are connected to disease. So you need a real patient published with that genes to say that that, that particular gene is responsible for a disease. It's not only that you have a biological process connected to it, to it or, you know, uh, understanding of the immunology uh, pathways or uh, organization. No, you need a patient. You need a patient that has a described disease to enter in the gene list. And so if you go there, you can find uh, many, many genes that you like <laughs> if you work with immunology. <laughs> And uh, normally what we do, we take this gene list, you go input in the platform of analysis if you, that you are using, and then you start to use filters inside filters inside uh, in the platform to try to reach out to the gene that's causing the disease of that in that patient, right? So when you use only the gene list in this case, you bring down the 95 and 94,000 variants to 2,000 variants. So it's very good. You know? At the beginning, so it started to be a little bit more uh, feasible, right, to do the analysis. But 2,000 is too much still, right? So a gene filter is not, uh, gene list filter is not enough to arrive to the, to the disease. So we went also to other filters that are very common when you work with uh, rare diseases. You go for allele frequency, and this is also a challenge in our country because we don't have enough exome sequencing in the country. In normal people, and what is normal, this is another challenge. <laughs> so to give us the frequency of that particular SNP, if it's uh, rare, or if it's something common in our population. So the unique initiative we have in the country that I know in Brazil is the Abraão uh, project. That's from USP guys that are here in there. And uh, it's a nice database, it's public. And uh, I think if I'm not wrong, it's uh, around 2000 exomes already deposited in this database and you can use as a way to see the allele frequency, okay? So normally we use what is uh, open to use even for Latins or other populations and also the Abram. So, and then you choose the allele frequency below than 2%. And also you can use filter uh, of pathogenicity inside of the platform. And this is another challenge because normally those databases are around two years um, delayed. Because for example, if I publish today a patient in the hospital we have with a new variant and I deposit in the most known database for pathogenicity that's called ClinVar inside of NCBA, it takes around two years for that particular variance going inside of the database around this. It takes super long. It's not you know, super quick because they, they need to curate the information that's being uh, done in every part of the world and everybody is submitting 
those variants. So it's a lot of work. And, uh, and that's why it takes so long to go inside. Okay, there are some paid database. For example, Kiergen has one database that is called HGMD database. Uh, there is a part that's free to use. This is around this two years delayed. And there is a paid area. And if you pay, uh, you receive the variants that are curated super quickly. And then you have the most uh, updated database to, to check pathogenicity. Okay, so you can use the this filter as a way to try to find a variant that could be causative, right, for the disease. And then we did this for this particular patient, and we found a, a variation in this gene. And the platform give us the place of the mutation, the change. It's a Missing mutation is saying here that it's pathogenic. And then you can go to different databases to understand the disease that's connected to that gene mutation. Okay? And then uh, in this particular patient, in this particular patient, we found this variant in a uh, Cohen syndrome. But when you read the phenotype of the kid, there's nothing to do with the phenotype uh, that the kids display in the in the allergy and immunology service in the hospital, because that kid in particular, uh, it has uh, pneumonia, repetitive pneumonia, and uh, they isolated in one of the, uh, one of the pneumonias, the Klebsiella uh, as, uh, as the agent. And, uh, and there's nothing to do, the disease here, it's really, uh, they, the kids display microcephaly and there are some facial uh, typical uh, 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 specific uh, uh, phenotype, right? In the, in, in, the, in the syndrome that was related there. And then we went uh, to, the, to the, another website that we use a lot in the lab to try to find the genes that are related to the disease. That's called the Human Phenotype Ontology. And, uh, and it's a very nice initiative. It's an international initiative that tries to correlate the genotype with the phenotype. And then you can, you can use terms, what they call HP terms, HPO terms. And you can write here in the search box the gene you want. And then you're going to see all the phenotypes that are related to that gene, particularly. And you can write also uh, the, the phenotype and you receive the genes. So it's, a, it's a very nice. So we write there the recurrent Klebsiella infection inside of HPO at that time because it was what the patients uh, was, was displaying, right, in the clinics. And we found a list of six genes only that is related to the chronic granulomatous uh, disease. And uh, we went back to the data of the exome and we started to look for uh, genes that could be mutated in this particular list of genes. Instead of going to pathogenic, alteration, we went to the list, right? So we take out the filter of pathogenicity. We went a little bit less stressful in the filtering. And we went only for allele frequency, the, what we call the variant of uncertain significance. So the gray area of our area. Okay, so where you do not know if it's pathogenic or not, you can use this kind of filter because there are some SNPs that you know they are benign. There are some that you know they are pathogenic, but there, there is a, an area that's it's an interrogation point, right? So we went to this guys here, the VUS, and the list that I took from the HPO, the Human Phenotype Ontology, right? And then a surprise, we found one uh, variant in, uh, in this particular gene. When we went to the database looking for the disease, it came the granulomatous disease. 
uh, it manifests with recurrent bacterial and fungal infection, what the kids was displaying, right? And, uh, and normally the defect, it's, uh, it's a gene defects in a complex called NADP oxidase. We went to a simple test using flow cytometry to demonstrate if the, the genes was really not working well. So the, the test is uh, called a GHR flow cytometry test. So you stress the neutrophils with uh, an activator, PMA, and you can see a control person here. When you activate the neutrophil, it started to produce uh, reactive oxygen and you convert the, the probe, the GRR, and then rhodamine one, two, three, and then it became fluorescent. So you can see clearly that is a normal person, theoretically like us. If you stress our neutrophils in vitro, they produce peroxide, uh, right? So if you go for our proban, you can put uh, kilos of PMA and you cannot activate the neutrophils of this particular kid. If you go for the mother and the sister of this proban, they have uh, one gene that is working and the other allele that's not working because it's an X-linked disease. So those uh, have half of the neutrophils working, right? And half not working, but they don't have any size of disease. They can deal with the infection well, very well, but when they have kids, they could, you know, give the X that's not correct to the kid. So this is, this is very nice, you know, even to comment that not only the diagnosis of this problem is important, but also to understand that potentially this is a future model of a CGD patient. So we need to do also the genetic counseling on that particular family, right? And theoretically, she can even demand from our universal, uh, our source to do, uh, or to choose uh, to do in vitro fertilization, to not have a kid that are like this proband here, okay? So after the next generation sequence, you can confirm the mutation by a simple Sanger uh, sequence, sequencing. Here, you can see the change, right? To an A in that particular position here. The mother, we can see clearly that has the two alleles there, right? And the health control is there also. But what was going on? I just come back super quickly because there is a, a, a nice commentary on the platform. So this is a synonymous mutation. So theoretically, what, what happened in the, in the molecule? Nothing, right? So I have a change in one nucleotide, but the codification of the protein theoretically is exactly the same. So I put the same amino acid there. Why this protein is not working? And I know it's not working because I did the functional test. But then it's a potential splice region. So, and then we went a little bit further to confirm what was happening in this uh, patient. So we designed a combination of primers to show if there was a case of what we call the exon skipping or uh, intro retention, okay? And at the end of the day, to be simpler here, so we have the profile of the proband that amplify, oops, it's not, uh, I'm trying to show you. <laughs> So, but it's easy to see, right? <laughs> so in the line of, uh, in the column of the proban, you can see, ah, almost there. Okay, you can, <laughs> you can see a band there that's uh, an amplification 
only when the axon four and F axon six, they are close enough to generate that amplicon, okay? And, uh, and then in the model, you have the two profiles there, easy to see. And in the health control, you have only the profile when you have the normal, you know, construction, axon four, five, and six. So this patient, they were changing the last nucleotide in the axon four and then jumping the splicing to the axon six and then removing an important part of the protein. And at the end of the day, the protein was not working well and not producing any uh, peroxide in the neutrophils. And then we sequence the, the amplicon and you can see clearly, it's very beautiful you know, <laughs> that you have, oh, so, uh, ah, okay, it's working. You, you can see the exon four, the exon five, the entire exon five in the health control and the exon six just afterwards. This is a cDNA, right? So we extract the, the RNA of this patient, did cDNA, and then after the amplification, we uh, sequence. And we did the same thing for the proband. And you can see the jump easy from the final exon four and beginning of the exon six, okay? In this particular patient. So what, what I would like to, to try to, to finish the, the idea is that, okay, we, we have the possibility of cell therapy on those kids. We can just replenish the bone marrow with, you know, uh, allogeneic uh, transplantation. And theoretically, we can solve the, the problem, right? So, but I, we think that if we change the gene, if we correct the gene, is going to be the best approach. The problem is how you do this safely, how you know exactly the gene that is causing the disease, and what's the best strategy that could be done for every kid. Because every kid is going to have, most probably, because the rare disease, a mutation in a different part of the gene. So the strategy that we are discussing is really to give the full gene back. So like a mini gene inside of the, of the vector and to, to put it back there and you know, ignoring the normal gene that is there that has the defect. And, uh, and maybe with this approach, you can be a more general approach for every uh, patient that display a defect, a gene defect in that particular gene. But the other challenge is to, ch is to choose which disease to go first. Obviously, normally you go for the diseases that you have um, a life expectancy that is uh, very short, that's a medical emergency, like the skid patient that I told you before. Uh, this patient that I show you the data, uh, uh, he lived until uh, 12 years old. And uh, you, can, you can maintain, depending on the chronic, uh, chronic granulomatosis disease, you can sustain them with uh, prophylactic antibiotic for full life. Uh, but this patient particularly, he could not you know, uh, sustain the, the, let's say, to be clean for, for the life. And then he got a uh, pulmonary infection with fungus. And he, he went to, to transplantation, uh, but didn't, but didn't um, uh, resist it to, to the therapy. And that, this is the, the, the biggest problem because if you transplant a kid, you know, that's uh, healthy enough in the beginning of the life, normally the results are better. And then in this particular kid that did uh, repetitive infection through all life, even he was treated, even that we know the gene defect, uh, he achieved, you know, a moment of the life that he was not super fit. And then during the bone marrow transplantation, he didn't, uh, he didn't resist. So it's really challenging even to choose the best approach and the best treatment through life.
because it's a, it's a chronic disease, right? So this is uh, what, what I would like to discuss with you guys. I'm, I'm very open to, to questions and uh, to any, any uh, appointments. And those are my contacts. And OK, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much <laughs> for the talk. Uh, the way we usually do is uh, we, uh, we let the students ask first, first. and then we start uh, asking questions from the postdocs and then the professors. So I'll check uh, here. I can see if there is anybody with a hands up and we can start over here. So if somebody has any questions. Uh, if not, I can start a discussion so we can give some time. Uh, so I, I understand and I think it's, uh, it's very interesting and applicable what you said about trying to choose the disease that uh, has the shorter lifespan such that if there is any problem, the, the patient already didn't have much of a chance. But in a case like you showed, that seems very straightforward in that the family already has heterozygous, it has cells that don't work and cells that work. And it shows that it is life compatible. Yes. Uh, it seems that you don't need a high efficiency in the treatment because no. if you have some cells that can react, uh, then it seems that even though it's a rare disease, uh, the tools seem very at hand and it could be a good, uh, of principle that that is a nice approach yeah. uh, so i wonder how does it work in the ethical committees and uh if you could choose a rarer disease but you have a, a more clear result because in skid as you mentioned there are 20 different possibilities so which one will will be the right gene you do you would have to see which which the right gene that you need to fix yes and the second question is how you uh you would have to to decide or choose which promoter to use such that you don't get overexpression if, and if you uh, also have to do some tests on that and if you have overexpression, what we have to do it to solve? Good, both are uh, great question, thank you. So the, the first, uh, it, the challenge is whenever you don't have something, if you put something inside of the system, normally it's gonna, it's gonna be even a space dependent way of uh, replenishing the system, right? So a, a skid patient that do not produce at all T cells, okay? For example, if there is a RAG1 or RAG2 mutation and you cannot produce any, any T or B cell. So if you correct uh, the system itself, replenish the, the T cell compartment, for example. So you don't need to correct 100% of the hematopoietic stem cells, and then you are good uh, because you have a pressure to replenish the system. But if we go to, to wiscott aldrich syndrome that you produce T cells, but they are not good, that's the problem of the disease. So they don't respond well for the antigen presenting cells. So it's not really uh, uh, white and black and white right. stuff. Mm -hmm then you need really to replenish or at least to have 80% of gene correction in the metaphoretic stem cells to be clinical uh, relevant, you know, to be clinical feasible to transplant that, uh, uh, that kit without all of those corrected stem cells. So this is the challenge. This is one of the challenges. To choose which gene, you, you need to diagnose more. You need to understand uh, the, what I call the genetic epidemiology of the diseases. That's why we, why we are trying to do a bigger network in Brazil, for example, to understand um, uh, what's the disease that are more frequent in our country. And, and not only going to, to the story of the life expectancy, because, okay, yeah, you can say that, ah, no, you need to be quick, you need to cure, otherwise the kid is dead. This is one point. The other point, and uh, I'm not here, I'm not here, here saying that, um, uh, let's say, could, could be a little bit not uh, super right, okay? But anyway, uh, what, what I think about it, there is a, also a health economics 
because some kids they intern so often in the hospitals and uh, they spend so much money in treatments for the full life that maybe if we treat this kid at the beginning of the life and you put back in the you know society. in the society you're gonna have uh, more economical or more money to invest in research to invest in curative therapies for the other kids so i do not know uh, which approach is going to be the best approach to do it but maybe if we we can we can improve the gene correction in the early life or the more frequent diseases could be even better than to correct the genes in the kids that you know they're gonna die early in life you know i know that the ethical part is super difficult but if you if you believe that you know the the money it's uh is limited how can we deal with this problem in our society i don't know i don't know the answer i'm just discussing here and thinking together with you how to how to, to design the best approach in our country and i understand that if the kid is already able to survive longer there might be a better health to exactly survive the treatment right yes even that because then maybe you can but invest a lot of money to do a gene therapy, but uh, the kid's not fit enough to respond to the treatment at the end of the day. That was the case exactly. in, that, in that one, right? Okay. Thank you. So I'll pass it to Bruno <laughs> and then we go to Sao Paulo. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> so, Zilton, thank you very, very much for your talk. Um, it's, uh, it's very interesting, but it's also very uh, scary. Because uh, uh, you're actually dealing with uh, uh, looking for, for the uh, proverbial needle in the haystack, and uh, those uh, 66 percent that uh, you can you cannot uh, identify. And uh, when uh, when uh, um, you bring um, an example like these, that's uh, uh, supposedly a single gene that uh, uh, should have been uh, easier, but uh, it's it's not easy. It's no. uh, it's something that uh, uh, if you, you are just looking for uh, mutations that are, are clearly uh, pathogenic, uh, you would never find yes, these, exactly. uh, these things. So, uh, um, uh, but now that, uh, that you know, uh, can you actually uh, improve the, the, the algorithms uh, that uh, will look for these uh, kind of um, alteration that uh, may change how the uh, how the splicing happens, and uh, uh, and then it can can have a, a much bigger uh, impact, not uh, just for these kids. Well, uh, actually but not for these ones. kids because uh, uh, yeah. uh, they are red best, but uh, you know for the yes. for the for the other kids. And uh, I'm speaking of, of these kids of these kids' family, uh, uh, what uh, uh, happens? Uh, uh, when you find something like this, uh, uh, you go back uh, to other other relatives, to uh, other generations, and yes. and try to uh, uh, broaden uh, your 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 search and uh, and to see if there are other people affected. And and uh, and uh, the last thing is uh, once you find something that uh, you know uh, you have the answer for the patient. How do you uh, get the hold of yourself not to, you know, uh, start uh, uh, studying uh, the minutia of all the all the mechanisms and everything? Because you know, uh, you you are, you are one person, and uh, yes. how can how can you you, you avoid uh, going down this uh, rabbit hole and uh, uh, and uh, and keeping your focus and. Uh, 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 going to the next patient and the next patient and uh, so, helping as many people as possible. It's almost impossible. <laughs> Thank you for the, for the question. So for the algorithms, the, the first thing that you told me, uh, I, nowadays we have a postdoc in collaboration with the uh, ECC, that's the Carlo Chagas Institute in Paraná, uh, doing that, trying to figure it out how to do less manually the search of what I show you today, because today it's too manual, right? You need to go and you need to go back and forth 
to be a little bit more inclusive and or less inclusive if you don't find something. So it's very hard. It's very hard even to not lose yourself in this, you know, <laughs> cycle and, uh, and do not go to the next patient, you know, instead of spending too much time in that particular one. So this is, uh, we have a role in the lab that you need to go in, in a straight protocol. And then whenever you find something, you return back immediately to the family. And those are the easiest one. And again, say you, that's going to be around 15%. So it's super straightforward. So you go to the, the first filter that I told you before, gene list, allele frequency, pathogenicity, and it's done. So 50% of the inborn errors of immunity, you solve like that. The other 50% is going to be a little bit more manual. And maybe the algorithm can help us, you know, to do it better, like artificial intelligence and this kind of thing, like a chat GPT for, uh, <laughs> for variants uh, ranking. Because what we are trying to do is really to rank better and put, you know, the, the variant that could be more pathogenic because of the other, um, uh, let's say, uh, informative, um, uh, what's called it is the um, uh, some predictors, predictors. <laughs> the predictors of uh, pathogenesis. Okay, and this is one way to do. But whenever you find something for the family, you go straight to the family and you try to, uh, to give back to them and to really screen, if you can, the full family to understand if they, for example, they have the gene mutation and they can pass for uh, the, the other, uh, the kids, you know, the sons, the, the, the next generation, right? So you, you go further. And, and the, the most complicated one are the autosomal dominant diseases, because then the gene is with the family, you know, since generation, and sometimes you don't know. For example, this family that I just told you before, uh, they lose one first child with the same disease. And this is the second child. And there are some family tragedies already, you know, because they do not know, it just suspected to have a gene defect and immunity in the second child, or even in the third child, depending where they live, because they live in Rio. So this is one thing. If they live, I don't know, in Amazonia, maybe they're gonna lose all the, the boys in the family and they never gonna think about it, a uh, gene defect in the immunology part, right? So this is also something very challenging. So if you think in a national uh, network to do this kind of work, you need to go to areas that nowadays we don't have any, any, any information about. Because where we are sequenced, Rio, Sao Paulo, Belo Horizonte. Maybe in the south, yes, in the south. Paraná, they are very good also. So we have four areas in, in Brazil that we are doing this work. Everything, a part of that is nothing. No, it's very challenging. And not going deep, sometimes you have a PhD thesis in one patient, four years of study in one patient. So try to reclassify a variant like this and to say, no, this variant, it's a VOS. No, this is pathogenic. So, and to put it up and to reclassify up a variant, you can take four years of study. You know? <laughs> it's, 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 it's the challenge. It's a. Gustavo, Diogo, I don't say. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, which one of you would like to quest to ask questions? And we're going to try to just uh, put the, the image here so Zilton can look at who is asking the question. But I think the sound is already okay whenever you want to ask. Hey, uh, Zilton, uh, great talk. We have a question from one of our students. Is it here? Hey. Samsung. Go there. Okay. Ah, good. <laughs> Hello. Hello. 
Oh, thank you for your talk. Um, it was really insightful. So well, I have two questions. Um, they are kind of related to the previous, the questions from the previous um, people that have talked earlier before. So the first one is um, in your years of study in your group, have you found any uh, gene or group of genes particular uh, peculiar to maybe Brazil or the South American region? Yeah, and if yes, do you have a kind of network of people working together to make this a, uh, a regional database that would help people like you working with that in your line of interest? Okay, now we, uh, the X-linked diseases, they are more common because of you know the the happening right so you have a mother that has nothing for example and then there are two childs that was with the same uh clinical characteristic or even infection and that's why it became a little bit more frequent to find those kids autosomical dominant disease also is something that you know if you see that graph that i show uh, in the genes that are being connected to inborn errors of immunity. The last two to five years, most of that genes, they are from autosomal dominant diseases. And normally a gain of function of a particular gene. And then you have a, a problem that is, it's just one mutation is causing the disease. If you have a, 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 a compound heterozygous disease, a recessive disease, it's more difficult, it's more infrequent in comparison to, to those diseases. And, and the other question that you told, uh, you, to did, uh, you did, it was about the databases, right? We, we are trying to use the, the databases that are shared with everyone in the world. So we don't create our own database. We don't believe this is a good approach. Right, we believe that we need to use the broader database that we can even to contribute internationally to find those kids and to find those patients. And uh, for example, our lab, we are submitting the variants that we are reclassifying to CleanVar as everybody, instead of creating something that's reserved, let's say for us, that do not make any sense, you know, the, those diseases are, too rare to imagine that we can we can have something that's exclusively uh, is exclusive for, for us you know or for Brazil for example so we need really to 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 try to convince people around the world that they need to share what they have with everyone you know with any any kind of uh, you know uh, reservation I would say so. say so okay I don't know if I answer your question. Yeah, yeah, you did. Yes, you did. So the, um, the second question is, uh, um, you talked about genetic cancer in the other time. So I was going to ask because um, in your one of your slides, uh, it showed that there is a kind of increasing list of, as years progresses, we have increasing list of genes involved in these uh, inborn errors of, of immunity. So do you think genetic cancer is one of the tools that could probably help in the future to reduce this frequency? This is this is it's a nice question, and I'm going to explore your question because uh, this is a big discussion in our country and in the world. Uh, the number of geneticists in Brazil it's too few to be able to do genetic counseling in the country. It's impossible. For example, our unit we have two geneticists formed per year. In, uh, in, in Rio de Janeiro, I would say so, because we are a reference center for genetics, right? So you can imagine that two people every year is enough to do genetic counseling for the population of Rio de Janeiro, it's impossible, right? So the discussion is really to form people in different areas to be a genetic counseling. And to be a genetic, do not mean that the guy is a geneticist. It's not this. It's just to explain to the family uh, what's the disease, uh, what's the implication of the gene mutation for the next 
generation of that family, the probability of that kid to receive the gene defect, the possibility to do fertilization in vitro or not in our health system. You know, this kind of discussion with the family, you know, and, and even sometimes discussion uh, with the, the parents to explain them that, that they are not guilty about that. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, they, they have a burden uh, on their, on that family, particular family, and they don't accept that uh, mutation uh, and that event that was unique that occurred in the family. And uh, they need to uh, understand that and understand the possibility of treatment. And I think we can contribute a lot with nursing, genetic counseling, and uh, other categor uh, categories of health professionals to do genetic counseling instead of only medical geneticists. And this is a big discussion in the country to contribute that particular area. That's another area, right? It's not what I do myself, you know, but we are connected to those people that are discussing this and it's part of the work to give back to the family uh, the information that we can generate uh, in the labs and in the diagnostic labs, right? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for your question. And I think this is a big discussion that needs to happen. Maybe psychologists, other yes. specialties that are uh, formed to deal with people and they can convey the information and take out the burden. Because as you mentioned, when all the boys are lost, there is always uh, some uh, weight that care, that the yes. family carries, right? Yes. We have one more question uh, here, at least by uh, Lucas, who's our student, PhD student. <laughs> no, but, uh, uh, <laughs> okay, Lucas is here. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you for talking, this very interesting. I was wondering if, um, you found any um, particular genes or mutations that are more frequent, even within the rare diseases, but mutations that are more frequent and that you think that are possible to be integrated into prenatal exams. So like with the prenatal genotype right, and everything. Right, right. And the, the, the logic, no, it's not, uh, it's like, okay. The logic to go to the prenatal screening test is not only to screen, but also to have a, a treatment. Because otherwise, it's also a burden to the family to identify just after birth that the kid has a disease and you have nothing to offer to the family, right? So the, the logic is this, right? But the uh, the the hundred thousand genomes uh, project in Britain is putting the table upside down, right? Because they are doing the whole genome sequencing on people, and whenever they found a mutation, even if they don't have anything to offer to the family. They have the data and they are returning back to the friends. And so we do not know what's going to happen the next years, but uh, I think uh, I think we're going to be better in identifying the, the most frequent genes. This is, I, I believe, yes, for sure. But we need to discuss more, even the ethical um, opening of that data for the family. There are people that are discussing things like, um, you're gonna give a mutation that is gonna cause a cancer in a person, but a cancer that the onset is, I don't know, with 45 years old, like, a, I don't know, breast cancer, to a baby or for that family at birth, or we're gonna keep this close, you know, like hidden, and then you open the information only when it's important to start to screen the cancer 
in the, I don't know, next 20 years or 30 years. So there are a lot of discussion, even to be opening the information about the gene mutation that you find in the person in a time, in a time scale, you know, instead of giving everything back to the person. You know, you give everything and then you, you solve yourself. And the other, and the other problem is uh, that we are discussing a lot is I, I do today uh, a, a gene sequence in a kid. Okay, so it's already done. And then when the kid, I don't know, has 50 years old, uh, maybe uh, got a cardiological problem, you know, that is more, the onset is very, uh, after that, it's a, a long way. And then how the cardiologist is gonna receive the data that was done in, uh, in the kid when he was, you know, with two or one year old, like we did, you know, how can we uh, give the data to that particular physician with safety without opening the data that's this is, is only the patient that needs to, to have that particular data, but he cannot deal with that, right? That data is nothing for him. Uh, only if it's interpreted by someone that could be able to interpret. So how can we send the data for the specific physician or the information to the physician for him to analyze the data, I don't know, years after? You know, how can we stock the information through life of everyone and to be able to deliver with safety to the right person? And the patient needs to choose who is the right person to receive the data. And th those are the challenges that we are, are discussing a lot because this data is forever, so we can use it forever for different questions, right? <laughs> yeah, and it seems like we're getting closer and closer to the movies, right? There's a mix of gacha <laughs> with uh, doing yeah. an implant with all the data such that can be scanned by the different doctors yeah. and then the doctor will have whatever yes. data is in your implant. And to not use the, da uh, the data, you know, like uh, in, in a bad way, right? Uh -huh. you know, That's true, yeah. Health insurance and all these kinds of things. That's, That's true. Yeah. And I think the, the most critical is what you mentioned. Every two years you're updating and the... Uh, the technology getting better, maybe those updates will be faster. So yes. what we don't know today in two years might be something huge. And how do we yes. access that? Right? It's, yes, it's true. Uh, so uh, we had a, a comment in the chat by Anderson Nunes thanking you for the presentation. He, sorry, he had to leave early. Uh, Master Gustavo, do you have any other questions on that end? Uh, no, I don't think so. Yes. Like to thank and congratulate this Excellent. Okay, work. so yeah. <laughs> we don't have any more questions from the audience that is the chat. Uh, so I'm going to thank you very much, Silton, for coming and bringing up this discussion. Besides the hard data and the beautiful thing you mentioned, there is also all those ethical and uh, timeless questions that is only getting bigger, right? Yes, yes. And uh, it's really nice to. And I start discussing uh, with more forums. So yes. uh, thank you very much. Thank everybody. And we get back next week. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah.